Section 11 of The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Omar Dutri. The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1. Madame Sarah. By L. T. Mead and Robert Eustache. Part 1. Everyone in trade, and a good many, who are not have heard of Warner's agency, the Solvency Inquiry Agency for all British trade. Its business is to know the financial condition of all wholesale and retail farms, from Rothschilds to the smallest sweet stuff shop in Whitechapel. I do not say that every farm figures on its books, but by methods of secret inquiry it can discover the status of any farm or individual. It is the great safeguard to British trade and prevents much fraudulent dealing. Of this agency, I, Dixon Drews, was appointed manager in 1890. Since then, I have met queer people and seen strange sights, for men do curious things for money in this world. It so happened that in June 1899, my business took me to Madeira on an inquiry of some importance. I left the island on the 14th of the month by the Norham Castle for Southampton. I embarked after dinner. It was a lovely night and the strains of the band in the public gardens of Funkel came floating across the star-powdered bay through the warm, balmy air. Then the engine bells rang to full speed ahead, and flinging a farewell to the fairest island on earth, I turned to the smoking-room in order to light my cheroot. Do you want a match, sir? The voice came from a slender young-looking man who stood near the tough rail. Before I could reply, he had struck one and held it out to me. Excuse me, he said as he tossed it overboard. But surely I am addressing Mr. Dixon Drews. You are, sir, I said, glancing keenly back at him. But you have the advantage of me. Don't you know me? He responded. Jack Selby, Hayward's House, Harrow, 1879. By Jove, so it is, I cried. Our hands met in a warm clasp, and a moment later I found myself sitting close to my old friend, who had fagged for me in the bygone days and whom I had not seen from the moment when I said good-bye to the hill in the grey mist of a December morning twenty years ago. He was a boy of fourteen then, but nevertheless I recognized him. His face was bronzed and good-looking, his features refined. As a boy, Selvai had been noted for his grace, his well-shaped head, his clean-cut features. These characteristics still were his, and although he was now slightly past his first youth, he was decidedly handsome. He gave me a quick sketch of his history. My father left me plenty of money, he said, and the meadows, our old family place, is now mine. I have a taste for natural history. That taste took me two years ago to South America. I have had my share of strange adventures, and have collected valuable specimens and trophies. I am now on my way home from Para, on the Amazon, having come by bootboat to Madeira, and changed there to the castle line. But why all this talk about myself? He added, bringing his deck chair a little nearer to mine. What about your history, old chap? Are you settled down with a wife and kiddies of your own? Or is that dream of your school days fulfilled? And are you the owner of the best private laboratory in London? As to the laboratory, I said, with a smile, you must come and see it. For the rest I am unmarried. Are you? I was married the day before I left Para, and my wife is on board with me. Capital, I answered. Let me hear all about it. You shall. Her maiden name was Dallas, Beatrice Dallas. She is just twenty now. Her father was an Englishman, and her mother is Spaniard. Now their parent is living. She has an elder sister, Edith, nearly thirty years of age, unmarried, who is on board with us. There is also a stepbrother, considerably older than either Edith or Beatrice. I met my wife last year in Para, and at once fell in love. I am the happiest man on earth. It goes without saying that I think her beautiful, and she is also very well off. The story of her wealth is a curious one. Her uncle, on the mother's side, was an extremely wealthy Spaniard, who made an enormous fortune in Brazil out of diamonds and minerals. He owned several mines. But it is supposed that his wealth turned his brain. At any rate, it seems to have done so, as far as the disposal of his money went. He divided the yearly profits and interest between his nephew and his two nieces, but declared that the property itself should never be split up. He has left the whole of it to that one of the three who should survive the others, 
a perfectly insane arrangement, but not, I believe, unprecedented in Brazil. Very insane, I echoed. What was he worth? Over two million sterlings. By Jove, I cried. What a sum. But what about the half-brother? He must be over forty years of age, and is evidently a bad lad. I have never seen him. His sisters won't speak to him, or have anything to do with him. I understand that he is a great gambler. I am further told that he is at present in England, and as there are certain technicalities to be gone through, before the girls can fully enjoy their incomes, one of the first things I must do when I get home is to find him out. He has to sign certain papers, for we shan't be able to put things straight until we get his whereabouts. Some time ago my wife and I did heard that he was ill, but dead or alive we must know all about him, and as quickly as possible. I made no answer, and he continued. I'll introduce you to my wife and sister-in-law tomorrow. Beatrice is quite a child compared to Edith, who acts towards her almost like a mother. B is a little beauty, so fresh and round and young-looking, but Edith is handsome too, although I sometimes think she is as vain as a peacock. By the way, Drews, this brings me to another part of my story. The sisters have an acquaintance on board, one of the most remarkable women I have ever met. She goes by the name of Madame Sarah, and knows London well. In fact, she confesses to having a shop in the Strand. What she has been doing in Brazil, I do not know, for she keeps all her affairs strictly private. But you will be amazed when I tell you what her calling is. What? I asked. A professional beautifier. She claims the privilege of restoring youth to those who consult her. She also declares that she can make quite ugly people handsome. There is no doubt that she is very clever. She knows a little bit of everything and has wonderful recipes with regard to medicines, surgery, and dentistry. She is a most lovely woman herself, very fair, with blue eyes, an innocent childlike manner, and quantities of rippling gold hair. She openly confesses that she is very much older than she appears. She looks about five and twenty. She seems to have travelled all over the world, and says that by birth she is a mixture of Indian and Italian, her father having been Italian and her mother Indian. Accompanying her is an Arab, a handsome, picturesque sort of fellow, who gives her the most absolute devotion, and she is also bringing back to England two Brazilians from Para. This woman deals in all sorts of curious secrets, but principally in cosmetics. Her shop in the Strand could, I fancy, tell many a strange history. Her clients go to her there, and she does what is necessary for them. It is a fact that she occasionally performs small surgical operations, and there is not a dentist in London who can vie with her. She confesses quite naively that she holds some secrets for making false teeth cling to the palate that no one knows of. Edith Dallas is devoted to her. In fact, her adoration amounts to idolatry. You give a very brilliant account of this woman, I said. You must introduce me tomorrow. I will, answered Jack with a smile. I should like your opinion of her. I am right glad I have met you, Drews. It is like old times. When we get to London, I mean to put up at my town house in Eaton Square for the remainder of the season. The meadows shall be refurnished, and B and I will take up our quarters sometime in August. Then you must come and see us. But I am afraid, before I give myself up to mere pleasure, I must find that precocious brother in law, Henry Joachim Silva. If you have any difficulty, apply to me, I said. I can put at your disposal, in an unofficial way, of course, as in so would find almost any man in England, dead or alive. I then proceeded to give Selby a short account of my own business. Thanks, he said presently. That is capital. You are the very man we want. The next morning, after breakfast, Jack introduced me to his wife and sister-in-law. They were both foreign-looking, but very handsome, and the wife in particular had a graceful and uncommon appearance. We had been chatting about five minutes when I saw coming down the deck a slight, rather small woman, wearing a big sun hat. Ah, madam! cried Selby. Here you are. I had the luck to meet an old friend on board, Mr. Dixon Jews, and I have been telling him all about you. I should like you to know each other. Jews, this lady is Madame Sarah, of whom I have spoken to you. Mr. Dixon Jews, Madame Sarah. She bowed gracefully, and then looked at me honestly. I had seldom seen a more lovely woman. By her side, both Mrs. Selby and her sister seemed to fade into insignificance. Her complexion was almost dazzlingly fair, her face refined in expression, her eyes penetrating, 
clever, and yet with the innocent frank age of a child. Her dress was very simple. She looked altogether like a young, fresh, and natural girl. As we sat chatting lightly and about commonplace topics, I instinctively felt that she took an interest in me, even greater than might be expected upon an ordinary introduction. By slow degrees, she so turned the conversation as to leave Selby and his wife and sister out, and then, as they moved away, she came a little nearer, and said in a low voice, I am very glad we have met, and yet how odd this meeting is. Was it really accidental? I do not understand you, I answered. I know who you are. She said lightly, You are the manager of Warner's agency. Its business is to know the private affairs of those people who would rather keep their own secrets. Now, Mr. Drews, I am going to be absolutely frank with you. I own a small shop in the Strand, a perfumery shop, and behind those innocent-looking doors I conduct the business which brings me in gold of the real. Have you, Mr. Drews, any objection to my continuing to make a livelihood in perfectly innocent ways? None whatever, I answered. You puzzle me by alluding to the subject. I want you to pay my shop a visit when you come to London. I have been away for three or four months. I do wonders for my clients, and they pay me largely for my services. I hold some perfectly innocent secrets which I cannot confide to anybody. I have obtained them partly from the Indians and partly from the natives of Brazil. I have lately been in Para to inquire into certain methods by which my trade can be improved. And your trade is, I said, looking at her with amusement and some surprise. I am a beautifier, she said lightly. She looked at me with a smile. You don't want me yet, Mr. Drews, but the time may come when even you will wish to keep back the informative's ears. In the meantime, can you guess my age? I will not hurt you the guess, I answered. And I will not tell you. Let it remain a secret. Meanwhile, understand that my calling is quite an open one, and I do hold secrets. I should advise you, Mr. Drews, even in your professional capacity, not to interfere with them. The childlike expression faded from her face as she uttered the last words. There seemed to ring a sort of challenge in her tone. She turned away after a few moments, and I rejoined my friends. You have been making acquaintance with Madame Sarah, Mr. Drews, said Mrs. Selby. Don't you think she is lovely? She is one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen, I answered. But there seems to be a mystery about her. Oh, indeed, there is, said Edith Dallas gravely. She asked me if I could guess her age. I continued. I did not try, but surely she cannot be more than five and twenty. No one knows her age, said Mrs. Selby, but I will tell you a curious fact, which perhaps you will not believe. She was bridesmaid at my mother's wedding thirty years ago. She declares that she never changes, and has no fear of old age. You mean that seriously? I cried. But surely it is impossible. Her name is on the register, and my mother knew her well. She was mysterious then, and I think my mother got into her power, but of that I am not certain. Anyhow, Edith and I adore her. Turn to Eddie. She led her hand affectionately on her sister's arm. Edith Dallas did not speak, but her face was scareworn. After a time, she said slowly, Madame Sarah is uncanny and terrible. There is, perhaps, no business imaginable, not even a lawyer's, that engenders suspicions more than mine. I hate all mysteries, both in persons and things. Mysteries are my natural enemies. I felt now that this woman was a distinct mystery, that she was interested in me, I did not doubt, perhaps because she was afraid of me. The rest of the voyage passed pleasantly enough. The more I saw Mrs. Selvi and her sister, the more I liked them. They were quiet, simple, and straightforward. I felt sure that they were both as good as gold. We parted at Waterloo, Jack and his wife and her sister going to Jack's house in Eaton Square, and I returning to my quarters in St. John's Wood. I had a house there, with a long garden, at the bottom of which was my laboratory, the laboratory that was the pride of my life, it being, I fondly considered, the best private laboratory in London. There I spent all my spare time making experiments and trying this chemical combination and the other, living in hopes of doing great things some day for one ascendancy was not to be the end of my career. Nevertheless, it interested me thoroughly, and I was not sorry to get back to my commercial conundrums. The next day, just before I started to go to my place of business, Jack Selby was announced. I want you to help me, he said. 
I have been already trying in a sort of general way to get information about my brother-in-law, but all in vain. There is no such person in any of the directories. Can you put me on the road to discovery? I said I could, and would, if you would leave the matter in my hands. With pleasure, he replied. You see how we are fixed up. Neither Edith nor B can get any money with regularity until the man is found. I cannot imagine why he hides himself. I will insert advertisements in the personal columns of the newspapers, I said, and request anyone who can give information to communicate with me at my office. I will also give instructions to all the branches of my firm, as well as to my head assistants in London, to keep their eyes open for any news. You may be quite certain that in a week or two we shall know all about him. Selby appeared cheered at this proposal, and having begged of me to call upon his wife and her sister as soon as possible, took his leave. On that very day, advertisements were drawn up and sent to several newspapers and inquiry agents, but week after week passed without the slightest result. Selby got very fidgety at the delay. He was never happy except in my presence, and insisted on my coming, whenever I had time, to his house. I was glad to do so, for I took an interest both in him and his belongings, and as to Madame Sarah, I could not get her out of my head. One day Mrs. Selby said to me, Have you ever been to see Madame? I know she would like to show you her shop and general surroundings. I did promise to call upon her, I answered, but I have not had time to do so yet. Will you come with me tomorrow morning? asked Edith Dallas suddenly. She turned red as she spoke, and the worried uneasy expression became more marked on her face. I had noticed for some time that she had been looking both nervous and depressed. I had first observed this peculiarity about her on board the Norham Castle, but as time went on, instead of lessening, it grew worse. Her face for so young a woman was haggard. She started at each sound, and Madame Sarah's name was never spoken in her presence without her avenging almost undue emotion. Will you come with me? she said with great eagerness. I immediately promised, and the next day, about eleven o'clock, Edith Dallas and I found ourselves in a hansom driving to Madame Sarah's shop. We reached it in a few minutes, and found an unpretentious little place wedged in between a hosier's on one side and a cheap print seller's on the other. In the windows of the shop were pyramids of perfume bottles, with scintillating facet stoppers tied with coloured ribbons. We stepped out of the hansom and went indoors. Inside the shop were a couple of steps, which led to a door of solid mahogany. This is the entrance to her private house, said Edith, and she pointed to a small brass plate, on which was engraved the name, Madame Sarah, Parfumios. And it touched an electric bell, and the door was immediately opened by a smartly dressed page boy. He looked at Miss Dallas as if he knew her very well, and said, Madam is within, and is expecting you, miss. He ushered us both into a quiet-looking room, soberly but handsomely furnished. He left us, closing the door, and it turned to me. Do you know where we are? she asked. We are standing at present in a small room just behind Madame Sarah's staff. I answered. Why are you so excited, Miss Dallas? What is the matter with you? We are on the threshold of a magician's cave, she replied. We shall soon be face to face with the most marvellous woman in the whole of London. There is no one like her. And you fear her, I said, dropping my voice to a whisper. She started, stepped back, and with great difficulty recovered her composure. At that moment the page boy returned to conduct us through a series of small waiting rooms, and we soon found ourselves in the presence of Madame herself. Ah, she said with a smile. This is delightful. You have kept your word at it, and I am greatly obliged to you. I will now show Mr. Drews some of the mysteries of my trade. But understand, sir, she added, that I shall not tell you any of my real secrets, only as you would like to know something about me you shall. How can you tell I should like to know about you? I asked. She gave me an honest glance, which somewhat astonished me. And then she said, Knowledge is power. Don't refuse what I am willing to give. Add it. You will not object to waiting here, while I show Mr. Drews through the rooms. First observe this room, Mr. Drews. It is lighted only from the roof. When the door shuts, it automatically locks itself, so that an intrusion from without is impossible. This is my sanctum sanctorum. A faint odor of perfume pervades the room. This is a hot day, but the room itself is cool. What do you think of it all? I made no answer. She walked to the other end and motioned to me to accompany her. There stood a polished oak square table, on which lay an array of extraordinary-looking articles and implements. 
stoppered bottles full of strange medicaments, mirrors, plain and concave, brushes, sprays, sponges, delicate needle-pointed instruments of bright steel, tiny lancets, and forceps. Facing this table was a chair, like those used by dentists. Above the chair hung electric lights in powerful reflectors, and lenses like bullseye lanterns. Another chair, supported on a glass pedestal, was kept there. Madame Sarah informed me, for administering static electricity. There were dry cell batteries for the continuous currents, and induction coils for faradic currents. There were also platinum needles for burning out the roots of hairs. Madame took me from this room into another, where a still more formidable array of instruments was to be found. Here were a wooden operating table and chloroform and ether apparatus. When I had looked at everything, she turned to me. Now you know, she said, I am a doctor, perhaps a quack. These are my secrets. By means of these I live and flourish. She turned her back on me and walked into the other room with the light springy step of Viot. Added Dallas, white as a ghost, was waiting for us. You have done your duty, my child, said Madame. Mr. Drews has seen just what I want him to see. I am very much obliged to you both. We shall meet tonight at Lady Farringdon's at home. Until then, farewell. When he got into the street and were driving back again to Eaton Square, I turned to add it. Many things puzzle me about your friend, I said, but perhaps none more than this. By what possible means can a woman, who owns to being the possessor of a shop, obtain the entry to some of the best houses in London? Why does society open her doors to this woman, Miss Dallas? I cannot quite tell you, was her reply. I only know the fact that wherever she goes, she is welcomed and treated with consideration, and wherever she fails to appear, there is a universally expressed feeling of regret. I had also been invited to Lady Farringdon's reception that evening, and I went there in a state of great curiosity. There was no doubt that Madame interested me. I was not sure of her. Beyond doubt, there was a mystery attached to her, and also, for some unaccountable reason, she wished both to propitiate and defy me. Why was this? I arrived early, and was standing in the crush near the head of the staircase when Madame was announced. She wore the richest white satin and quantities of diamonds. I saw her hostess bend towards her and talk eagerly. I noticed Madame's reply and the pleased expression that crossed Lady Farringdon's face. A few minutes later, a man with a foreign-looking face and long beard sat down before the grand piano. He played a light prelude, and Madame Sarah began to sing. Her voice was sweet and low, with an extraordinary pathos in it. It was the shout of voice that penetrates to the heart. There was an instant pause in the gay chatter. She sang amidst perfect silence, and when the song had come to an end, there followed a few roar of applause. I was just turning to say something to my nearest neighbor when I observed Edith Dallas, who was standing close by. Her eyes met mine. She laid her hand on my sleeve. The room is hot, she said, half panting as she spoke. Take me out on the balcony. I did so. The atmosphere of the reception rooms was almost intolerable, but it was comparatively cool in the open air. I must not lose sight of her, she said suddenly. Of whom? I asked, somewhat astonished at her words. Of Sarah. She is there, I said. You can see her from where you stand. We happened to be alone. I came a little closer. Why are you afraid of her? I asked. Are you sure that we shall not be hurt? was her answer. She terrifies me, were her next words. I will not betray your confidence, Miss Dallas. Will you not trust me? You ought to give me a reason for your fears. I cannot. I dare not. I have said far too much already. Don't keep me, Mr. Drews. She must not find us together. As she spoke, she pushed her away through the crowd, and before I could stop her, was standing by Madame Sarah's side. End of Madame Sarah by Elty Mead and Robert Eustache Part 1